Welcome back. So now we're turning our attention to attention and higher level cognition. So a great place to start is by just talking about what is attention. While we all seem to be able to have a sense of what it is, it's rather hard to define. And it seems to fall under the um it seems to fall under the same rule as the former Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart's defi definition of pornography, which is I know it when I see it, which, by the way, is a horrible operational definition. Thus, we will attempt to do better with attention. So d attention is a state of selective awareness or of perceptual receptivity in which stimuli are selected for enhanced processing. Thus, attention is vital for cognition and memory, as it is for the most part, required for processing. The quality and level of attention is greatly affected by arousal, which is the global non-selective level of alertness of an individual. So as arousal drops, as may happen when you're reading your biological psychology textbook, so does attention, cognition, etc. Most of our attention is overt attention, which is... Um, attention in which your focus coincides with sensory orientation. So in other words, you are attending to and looking at the same thing. So when you thought about attention, this is probably what came to mind. However, there's also covert attention, which is attention where the focus can be directed independent of the sensory stimulation, such as attending to another sensory stimulus while looking at another. So there are plenty of um, you who are in the state right now. You're, you know, you're looking at me, you're pretending to pay attention or trying to pay attention, but really your mind is far, far away from what's going on right here. So one of the main purposes of attention is to focus on the relevant information while blocking out the irrelevant information. This is perhaps best seen in the cocktail party effect which is where one selectively enhances certain stimuli, such as the person you're talking to, while blocking out the other stimuli. This is why you're able to talk to someone at a cocktail party and understand them despite being surrounded by other people speaking at the same volume. So, a couple tests of attention. Um, one is dichotic presentation. So here, with dichotic presentation, you have simultaneous delivery of different stimuli to both ears at the same time. And what has been found is that with listening to different directions in each ear, we are only able to recall the ear that we're told to pay attention to. In fact, even when the participant's name was said in the non-attended ear, it was ignored 66% of the time. So even though we're getting information receiving it in, in both ears, our attention really seems important for what we're actually conscious of and able to encode. Um, there's also an intentional bias, which is um, where you don't notice um, things that you're not attending to. So with that, an example here with the dichotic presentation is when I'm not attending to this ear, I'm blind to that ear. I I don't know what's happening in this ear. So it's a, it's explaining the fact that we seem blind to what we're not paying attention to. There's also change blindness, which um, is a failure to notice changes when comparing two alternating static visual scenes. And this relies on short-term memory. So you're actually, you know, comparing what you're experiencing now to short-term memory, and that can cause people chain or problems as well. So I have a brief video. You've probably seen something like this, but for those of you who haven't, you're in for your, a real treat. This is the test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball.
How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? So, as the video illustrates, you know, again, many of you have probably seen this before, but hopefully for a couple of you, you got the experience of not seeing the, um, the gorilla. If we're not paying attention to something, if we're told to pay attention to something else, we can often be blind to the things that are happening around us. So again, that's an attentional bias. Now, let's even take it up a notch. Um, clearly, if there is an obvious change that happened right in front of you, you wouldn't miss it, right? Clearly. Well, as many of you know, I love Darren Brown. He's a um, a performer in England. I think he's brilliant. Um, let's let's see something that Darren Brown did and see if you still feel that way after. Of course, I should mention Darren Brown wasn't the first person to do this. This comes from psychological research, but still, it's a really nice demonstration of it. Most of us think we're pretty observant, but with a bit of mind control, I wanted to see if I could make these people take even the most obvious things for granted. Excuse me. Do you know how to get to Trinity Church from here? Yeah. You see that church down there? Yep, straight through there. And then you can keep going down. Yeah, sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Which way? You see where that church is down there? Yeah. You stay on that, which is, I believe, Broadway. And then you walk down two or three blocks, and Trinity Church is on the right hand side. We're walking in that direction. Okay. Excuse me, you don't know where Trinity Church is, do you? Might be Wall Street and Broadway. Okay. Well, we're, we're down here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah, you see, Trinity Church. Make... Oops, sorry. 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 Uh, yeah. Inside the Trinity Church, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you keep going that way, then you left Broadway, then you go on a couple of blocks. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks very much. That seemed almost too easy, so later on, I see how far I can take it. Excuse me, do you know where uh, Trinity Church is? In that okay. Yeah. Last time I switched with someone who looked a little bit like me, but where's the fun in that? Thank you, man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. you know who, who best to rescue you? You, the other side? You see where the lady's standing? Sure. That's the pool. No, the lady in the gray. The other side? Yeah, the other side of but the you, pool. But so you don't know where it is? Uh, exactly what street, no, but it's in that direction. Okay. Yeah, thank you. okay? Thank you. Excuse me. Do you know where um, Trinity Church is from here? Uh, yeah, fine. Come on, come on. I'll take you. Or you want to walk now? Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to catch some other people. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry. guys. <laughs> okay, listen. Saying. Once you go on Broadway, yes. Remember the numbers are going. I could have sworn it was another guy. <laughs> um, on. Once you hit the Broadway, you're going down. Yes. Walk up straight so that, that way. way and just walk straight down. You're going to see it. It's, right, it's really brown. That's brilliant. Thanks for your help. All right, bye. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Excuse me. Do you know where Trinity Church is? Yeah. Ah, great. Yeah. Well, where are we on here? We sort of there. Right here. Right here. Thank you. Go on. We are at Brooklyn Bridge. You want to cross over there, go down Broadway, and you'll see right there. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, mate, do you know this area? Do you know the area? Do you know where uh, Piccadilly Circus? Oh, you got the tree. So through there? Yeah, through there, that's your list of spirit. Sorry, go on for me. Where? Uh, Keep going to this way. This way. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, well, careful of the car. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Excuse me. Are you, are you familiar with this area? No. No. Okay. All right. Uh, Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus. Um, coming yeah. back from here. Piccadilly Circus is. Oh, right sorry. Here. Hang on. Sorry. Sorry. Which? Um, I just found right here. Okay, so is that straight over? Definitely not that way. Um, these are the cases I know it's that direction. Over so. that way. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you.
this area at all? Uh, a little bit. Can we get to St Paul's from here? I'm not even quite sure where we are. I'm sure that wouldn't have worked quite as well if I was a very famous pop star. Well, it took me over two hours to find Francesco's keys, which was disappointing. But I did go to Venice for free, and I didn't fall into the canal on the way home like a twat. Sorry, I need to get some pools from here. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Ah, okay. Is it correct? Mm. Do you know where we're on here? So, as you can see, there are a couple people that caught on to it a little bit, but by and large, a lot of people went with it, and uh, even sometimes with very large changes in the individual they were talking to, completely unaware that it had changed. So, very interesting. It just shows how blind we are to whatever we're not paying attention to. So, how do we explain this? Well, a couple ways. One is our attention works like a spotlight. It shifts around our limited selective attention to different parts of the environment for enhanced processing. If the spotlight isn't on the material, it will likely not be processed until it breaks into consciousness. This leads us well into the idea of an attentional bottleneck which is a filter that results from the limits, um, the intrinsic limits of our intentional processes with the result that only the most important stimuli are selected. So what does this look like? Well, you can have early selection models of attention, um, which is where you actually have the bottleneck here after it's registered, but before we have a perceptual or analysis of the meaning. So before we try to figure out what it means or process it, it gets cut down to just the things we're paying attention to. So this model works well for many things. However, what it can explain is how certain things, such as your name, can be processed and break into consciousness. So, you know, say I'm talking to someone and someone on the other side of the room says my name and I suddenly I know that they did it. How did this model cannot explain that. However, what could explain that is if you have a later um, selection model. So here you have all the sensory information received. It all gets processed for synaptic, um, semantic meaning. And then you have your attentional bottleneck. So then it filters out anything that's not important and only the things that you are paying attention to, only the things that are important, get filtered or get filtered through onto higher analysis. So this explains um, how some information is processed but doesn't seem to make it into awareness. The Stroop test also provides evidence for a later attentional bottleneck. In the Stroop test, irrelevant information interferes with target stimuli, stimuli at a semantic level, suggesting that this information must also be being processed. Thus, accurate attention in this test must involve late attentional selection. So, said differently, Stroop test is where if I'm trying to read these um, these words, I have difficulty because um, well, assuming the words aren't in the proper color. So up here, it's probably pretty easy. But when I get down here where the color and the word are not congruent, I start having trouble because that, of that non-congruency. So with that, an early bottleneck wouldn't make sense because that has the bottleneck before you perceive meaning. And that would mean that this would all come after that bottleneck. So you'd filter out things like the color before that bottleneck. Rather, this is evidence of a later bottleneck because it's um, a problem with incongruent 
a perception of meaning for each word. So hopefully that made sense, but it's evidence of a later bottleneck. So also there's intentional blink. So when simple visual stimuli are rapidly presented one after another, subjects are very poor at detecting stimuli um, if, it, if they follow about 200 to 450 milliseconds after, which is pretty late into processing. This is known as attentional blink, and since it comes so late in processing, it's thought to support a later bottleneck as well. So, how do we how do we conceptualize this? So, we have some evidence for an early bottleneck, some evidence for a later bottleneck, and it may come down to perceptual load. They may both be right. Um, so perceptual load is the immediate processing challenge presented by a stimulus. So the thought here is that when we have something that's very complex, we have an early bottleneck and only focus on the relevant material. However, when the processing isn't all that difficult, we have a later bottleneck and process more information that may or may not be irrelevant. This made some sense because, for instance, I am more likely to hear my name if I'm just sitting somewhere and not doing anything than if I'm reading a research article. 